This video is going to be loaded with information about developing web applications which interact with the client server kind of a model. These techniques can be useful in designing different types of systems. There is no one size fits all. So in order to design a distributed system with microservices architecture, we need to know all these three different techniques and come to a consensus on when to use which approach. And the agenda goes like this. We are going to look at individually what are these techniques and how to use them. We will also take a look at when to use these techniques by overlaying them with the example of Zeroda and also a simple gaming application. We will finally look at the pros and cons to understand when we can leverage each of these techniques. So let's first understand what are these individual techniques and their terms. When we design web applications, we generally have a client and a server model where the client is always the initiator of the transaction or a request to the server and the server responds to these requests. However, sometimes there are use cases where we want the server to respond much more frequently or the server needs to respond or give more information than the client is asking for. That's where we use all these techniques. And the first one is the HTTP long polling. Imagine we have a client and the server kind of an architecture where the client sends a request and the client waits for the request from the server. So the server can be aggregating these requests or maybe the server is like waiting to respond with a lot of information or maybe it's just like timing out, right? We don't know. So the server now responds back to its client and immediately when the client receives the response, the client again initiates a new connection to the server so that it doesn't miss any new information. And again, it waits and then the loop continues. So this type of a mechanism where we keep on polling the server to behave it like a streaming transaction is called HTTP long polling. Basically, we are polling the server from the client side so that we don't miss any information. And the response usually has all this information. And immediately after the response, we create a request so that new information or new data is not missed. The next one is server sent events. SSE or server sent events is not a new technique. However, it's a predominant technique when you want to have unidirectional flow. So let's imagine the same case client and the server. We will be initiating a request from the client to the server. For example, I want to get all the messages from the server. So I just say get messages and the server responds with different response timelines or different messages within that particular stream. So I'm creating a channel from the client to the server and the server responds within that particular channel, but the client is not going to respond back or maybe like request something to the server. And this is a established channel and this is a stateful channel. Unlike long polling, long polling had initiated the request, closed it and then reopened it again. But here, we just opened a communication bridge and within that the server is responding us with some data. And finally, obviously the client can close the connection or even the server can time out and close the connection. These are called as server sent events where the flow of data is unidirectional. The client requests the server for the data and the server keeps on sending the data to the client. This is one predominant technique which people use when they want just data from a server and they don't want anything else to be sent from the client. One common example could be a live stream where you're just watching a live stream, which could be a cricket match. For example, IPL is an example. We can leverage SSE in that particular case where the video is just streamed to all our devices. The final one is the web sockets. Web sockets, again, it's a similar client server architecture. The client has to initiate a request. And once the client initiates the request, uh, again, similar to the SSE, we create a channel between the client and the server. And within that particular channel, you can have bi-directional flows. So there could be a single request and then multiple responses. You can have multiple requests and multiple responses, and these are asynchronous. So this is where WebSockets are different from the other two because it's completely different protocol and the way it functions is different from the other two. And finally, we can send a disconnect from the client. Again, client this and the server can also time out if let's say the client did not send any request. So HTTP, Polling, as the name suggests, uses HTTP protocol. Usually these messages are of type application JSON, text plane, or XML, etc. Right? Generally, the HTTP polling standards are between 100 seconds to 300 seconds. So every request 
times out after that particular time. So their long polling could be between 100 seconds to 300 seconds max. In terms of server sent events, again, it follows the HTTP protocol. When we send the request, we send it using the media type text slash event stream. Any API which uses the event stream, it is by default stamped as server sent events. Also, there is a distinction of the data. So the data is colon is just a prefix which is added to the messages. You can also compress them or maybe you can play around with the data just to make the traffic size to be less. There are people who use encoding techniques to just chunk the data and then send it from the server to the client. We can do that or if you just don't do it, it will just be prefixed with data colon and the data will be there within that response. In the WebSockets, WebSockets are a completely different protocol. Similar to HTTP colon double slash, WebSocket uses WS colon double slash. If it is secured one, you, it just uses WSS. Similar to HTTPS, it uses WSS colon double slash. It's a completely different protocol. Now coming to when to use these techniques. First, let's look at the long polling. If you're new to Zerodha, Zerodha is a trading application similar to Robinhood if you're in the US. It's just a trading application using which you can buy and sell stocks. So in case of Zerodha, this is how the platform looks like. So the platform has a mobile application. There's also a web application, which I have not mentioned. There is an API gateway where all the requests are coming in and then getting redirected. There are historical APIs to look at old trade information or charts. There is also a watch list API. There is a trade executor API using which you can execute trades. There is authentication layer. And also finally, there is a UPI service, which is a payment engine. So UPI is unified payment interface which is specific to India, but imagine it like any payment gateway or a payment service. Now, what happens in Zerodha is the moment you initiate a payment, the payment system goes to the NPCI. It opens another app. For example, I'm using the Zerodha Kite application in mobile. It can open another UPI service app, and then I can do that payment in the UPI service app. And this UPI service in the UI just keeps on waiting. And that's where we can leverage HTTP long polling so that we can identify whether a payment has been successful or not every few seconds. Once the payment is successful, the payment engine responds back with the successful message and the transaction completes. So this is an example where you can leverage long polling. So under the hood, it might be just polling the payment platform every few seconds. And we might be leveraging a different app or a different device even to pay that particular transaction amount using a different app. And then the long polling will be able to identify if the response was sent from the payment engine and then it will be sent back to the UPI service and then it just marks that as successful in the app. Now in the same Zerodha application, let's see where can we leverage the server sent events. Let's look at the same architecture. Now notice that there is a watch list API. This watch list API shows the list of favorite stocks which you have bookmarked. So from the client application, you have bookmarked your favorite stocks and you want to see the updates of those stocks in your dashboard real time, right? So Zerodha has to get the data from the matching engine or maybe from the stock exchange, right? Stock exchange will be feeding real time information into Zerodha or the trading platform. And the trading platform now has to register you for a watch list and then they have to like send the data to the customer. So that's what happens in the watch list API. Watch list API uses the server sent events from the client side, we initiate get trades or get messages or get real time trades. And zero the watchlist API will keep on pushing data into the customer's UI or the application. This is where you can leverage server sent events where you want to constantly get some updates about a particular transaction or a stock. Now, finally, for the web sockets, we can in fact leverage the same use case here for the watchlist to use web sockets. However, the web sockets are bi-directional. In, in this particular case, I didn't want to use web sockets because it's just unidirectional. I just want to watch the trades. I didn't want to do anything with it, right? But in case of a gaming application, you would require web sockets because you have to go back and forth in terms of giving some action to the game. For example, if let's say I'm playing Warzone, I should be able to shoot somebody or I should be able to pick up some guns or whatever those interactive actions are all done via the web sockets. So the requests coming in from the PC or the mobile application are all done via web sockets. So there is a persistent connection between the client application and the server. So from the client and the gaming engine, there is a persistent connection. 
and within the connection we do have bidirectional asynchronous messages which are getting replayed from the client to the server this is just a simple example but if you look at the gist of it we need to know when we can leverage web sockets or http long polling or sse events finally let's look at the pros and cons of all these so as i mentioned http long polling the name suggests it is http so it is very easy you have support for http in almost every framework or every browser etc it is very easy to implement because it's just a http call you just keep on going to iterate it whenever the response comes back you can use a http keep alive to keep the connection alive for 100 to 300 seconds the cons for this long polling is it adds more latency because you are going to keep on waiting for a particular period of time because you don't know when the response will come in and the request and the threads are blocked in addition to it every single time a new connection is created and destroyed so the connection is costlier every single time and finally there is no guarantee on the ordering because a client is going to initiate the connection and if the response comes back it's going to initiate the connection again so there could be a problem with reliability because what if it took more, some more time to request or maybe something happened within that particular time so there is no guarantee on the reliability on the ordering when you are querying the server in the long polling technique in case of server sent events it's again very easy to implement it again is based on http the pros are exactly the same in addition to it it is also lightweight because in http polling we had created multiple connections and destroyed multiple connections but in terms of sse events we create a connection only once and then we keep on listening to the events whenever they come in so it's lightweight the cons for server sent events are that it is unidirectional you can just request for something and then you can just keep on listening to it but you cannot send some more request to modify it or request more information it's just unidirectional in that particular channel it also doesn't support binary data transmission because server sent events are designed for streaming data which is in the form of text also there are limited number of open connections because it uses http protocol again it, there is going to be blockage in terms of the number of requests which are connected to that particular web server so there is going to be a limited number of connections to it, to the web server finally let's look at the web sockets pros web sockets are bind directional and asynchronous so it's a huge advantage in terms of rec getting request and then responding it back in an asynchronous manner it also supports binary data transmission it is again lightweight because it creates only a single channel the cons for web sockets are there is no automatic recovery of data let's say if a termination happens and if it tries to reconnect there is no automatic recovery uh, in case of failure it also has limited support in terms of using older browsers so if the browsers are a bit old web sockets are not supported as we expect it to be these are some of the pros and cons of all these techniques i'll just summarize what we just discussed we looked at what is http long polling using http long polling we can create request and then wait for a particular period of time and then initiate new request again when this request is responded from the server usually these are http techniques in the sse events these are text streams using text streams we create a channel and within the channel we keep on getting response from the server side so the client initiates the request and server keeps on sending the response and it is unidirectional in terms of web sockets it is bidirectional you create a connection and then you keep on talking within the channel the only difference is this is a separate protocol unlike http we also saw how we can leverage these techniques in zerodha and gaming applications in terms of having bidirectional and unidirectional flows finally we wrapped up with the pros and cons of individual techniques i hope this particular video was helpful always choose a technique based on your use case and also the architecture which you are designing in there is no silver bullet on which one is the ultimate option to be chosen but choose that particular option based on the pros and cons and also the trade offs which you take in a system design as always if you like the video go ahead and like it if you haven't subscribed to the channel go ahead and subscribe to it meet you again in the next video thank you very much